Hi guys, welcome to another Monday night study. A ways back, we had been doing some research in the, the timeline and trying to put things together a little bit better. And um, Enoch has a certain timeline. Jubilees has a certain timeline. The Dead Sea Scrolls in general have a certain timeline. They mesh really well together, but it's a different way of doing things. And then we as Americans have a... Um, AD, BC timeline. So same thing. Trying to make sure that I am live. Yep. Okay. Uh, so um, I wanted to show you something I'm working on. I was working on these before and it got a little cumbersome. So basically we're going to study the Enoch calendar. Uh, not the calendar, but a prophecy, which is a different kind of calendar. We need to pull everything together. So here we have, and this is a timeline study. It's not completely up yet on the website because I need to double check the numbers. But what I did have was the AM, BC, and the event, which is good enough. But the thing that the Jubilee chart does is breaking everything up in, in Jubilees and in Shemitahs. So this is the way this works. You've got, um, for instance, with creation, the first seven years are the first Shemitah. So that's the S1. So that's year one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The Shemitah number two would be the year eight through 14, all the way down to Shemitah 43 through 49. And then after 49 years or seven times seven years, you have a Jubilee year. And so then it, then it copies. So you've got Shemitahs 1 through 7 and a second Jubilee and on down. So with each one of these ages, as you remember, the ages of creation, there, there are three ages of 2,000 years apiece. It's the age of creation, Torah, grace, and then a 1,000-year kingdom age. Now, in the New Testament, we talk about six years of, of, of man's history and a 1,000-year millennial reign. We talk about it cryptically in the Old Testament also. And this is the way the Essenes taught it. So each one of these 2,000 years, or in the kingdom, the two pieces, each one of these is a 500-year period. So not long ago, we found a prophecy in one of the Dead Sea Scrolls talking specifically about what was going to happen in Ona 8, or the 8th period, the 4th period of the Age of Torah. And it was really interesting because it did happen. So that let us know that they numbered them not just one through four repetitively, but 14 ages, basically. And so what we're trying to do is add the events now so we'd have an AM and a BC time frame for each Shemitah uh, set of seven years or a Jubilee year, and then add the actual dates in here. So we're working on that. Hopefully that'll be up sometime this week. But down here, what, what I want to show you today is a timeline we did from Enoch's 10-week prophecy. So again, what this is, is the Essene way of looking at the 7,000 years. Three sets of three of 2,000 years apiece and a millennial reign. Enoch did it a little differently. He looked at it in a period of 10 weeks. Okay, so it's still the 7,000 years, but you'll see each day is actually a, dec a, a century. So on the Gregorian calendar, we have decades and centuries, which are sets of 10 and 100 years. The Essenes had Shemitahs and Jubilees, which are sets of 7 and 50 years. So Enoch basically calls one day 100 years. So the second day of week one, for instance, is uh, 100 to 199, and it goes on down like that. So there's week one, two, three, four. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and then eternity. And that's how he grouped those together. So it's the same time period, but he gave prophecies of certain things that would happen. And the reason I'm doing this is I wanted to go back to that prophecy tonight and look at that. And then there's a piece in the middle of the prophecies. Everything works perfectly, except for one little piece of the prophecies in the middle. And we're all speculating on what it might have meant. And Josh Peck has a theory that he had run into. So we will 
try to have him as a guest uh, on this program next Monday to talk about what he thinks it might mean. But to get us all up to speed, I thought it would be good to look at the whole thing. So we'll come back to here and look at this, and eventually this will be on. If there's any other timelines, we'll put them down here. But for now, let's go to, this is the Book of Enoch, and the Book of Enoch actually is, is divided into many place, places, rather. Um, so the, the beginning part is all that Nephilim history, and then you've got the astronomical calendar, which is what we use to uh, help figure out the Essene calendar. And then several dreams and other things. But this one here, the Apocalypse of Weeks, is in chapters 91 through 93. And that's basically what we want to look at. So he's going to break up time from eternity to eternity into a 7,000-year period. Instead of three sets of 2,000 years and a millennial reign, he's going to simply break it up into uh, a century per day and then 10 weeks or 7,000 years. So let's look at this. First off, let's note this, that uh, chapter 93 was placed at the end of chapter 91, and then 92 came later. So I went ahead and put them in order so that it makes sense in this version. Uh, but that tells us, number one, that the Ethiopic version has gotten garbled in places. So what's interesting is, is we'll go through and we'll look at this and see a couple of other things like that. So starting in chapter 91 is this vision that he sees, and he's telling it to his son Methuselah. And um, he says, Now, my son Methuselah, call all of your brothers and all of your mother's children to me, for the word calls me and the spirit pours upon me that I may tell you everything that will happen in the future. Now, notice that the word calls him. And, of course, who is the word? You see this consistently throughout all the scrolls. The word of the Lord came to him and said something. So this is like a Christophany. The spirit is poured upon me. So he's, um, the Holy Spirit is upon him. And he's going to tell him everything that happens in the future. Now, Enoch would have been, and we can go back and look at this in the, in the chart, but Enoch was born in the year 622. 622? I think it is 622. Um, and you can figure this out by going to Genesis and just looking at Adam was created. When Adam was 130, Seth was born. Uh, when so many years later, the next one was born, and you go all the way up to Enoch. So there's a lot of interesting prophecies in here, but we'll stick to, to this one particularly. So uh, Methuselah went and summoned all of his brothers and assembled his relatives. And he spoke of the righteous righteousness to all of his children. And he said, listen, my children, to all the words of your father and take seriously my speech, for I need to warn you, beloved. Love righteousness and walk in it. Do not approach righteousness with a double heart. And you'll see that through the scrolls a lot, too. If you say, well, I'll try it your way, but if it gets too tough, I'll just do something else. That's not true repentance. Do not approach righteousness with a double heart. Associate not with those of a double heart. Uh, but walk in justice, my sons. It will guide you on good paths, and righteousness will be your companion. So what he's showing here is, uh, as this intro, we need to follow righteousness. And what we're going to see and what we have seen in history is that God judges unrighteousness. Sometimes he lets it go for an unknown length of time, but there's always a wrath being poured out on people that are unrighteous or nations or groups or uh, the entire world at one point. So... So he says, for you know that violence must increase on the earth and a great judgment will be executed on the earth. All unrighteousness will cease and be cut off at its roots and the whole structure destroyed. And he's talking about, of course, the flood at this point. Uh, it's interesting to know that we have the testaments of all the patriarchs um, that they're mentioned, rather. We have fragments of close to half of them in the Dead Sea Scrolls. 
And that would be from Adam to Aaron, who taught their children just like this, a, a last will and testament kind of thing to their children. Josephus records that Adam mentioned in his testament that the world would be destroyed once by a flood of water and once by a rain of fire, but he wasn't sure which one would come first. And I thought that was interesting. And, and of course, for Josephus to make a comment like that, you have to wonder if he's not just making this up out of the blue, where did he get that statement? It has to be written somewhere and apparently in one of the uh, Testaments. So he's saying you have to understand what's coming. Some of the other prophecies in Enoch are, are pretty interesting. The Messiah, when he does come, will be the 70th generation from Enoch. And when you go into like Luke and Matthew, first couple chapters of those, um, you can find the genealogy of Jesus going all the way back to Adam. So if you start with Enoch and go forward, you'll notice that Jesus actually was the 70th from Enoch. So that's pretty interesting. So there's a lot of things like that in here. So he's going to talk about these things. So that's the judgments coming. And then he says this, and unrighteousness will a second time be consumed on the earth and all the deeds of sin, violence, and godlessness will prevail. When sin, blasphemy, unrighteousness, and all kinds of violent deeds increase, and apostasy, transgression, and uncleanness increase, there will be a great judgment from heaven on all of these. Now, according to the, the scrolls, Adam wasn't sure which one would come first. But Canaan, uh, in his wisdom, was able to understand that the flood judgment comes first. So it wasn't even Enoch at this point, but it's common knowledge at this point uh, that the flood of water comes first. And then secondarily, this other. But notice this, uh, sin in general is missing the mark. You do it a lot when you simply don't care. And blasphemy, we, a lot of people get confused on blasphemy. Blasphemy is... Um, not believing what the prophets wrote. So in other words, if you say, I think God is a woman, I think there's 20 gods. I don't think there is a God. I think God died. You know, all those different theories. Well, is that what the prophets said? Well, no. Then you're calling the prophets a liar. That's blasphemy. Now to say, I don't understand the prophets, and I don't mean any disrespect, but I don't see how this is that, that's fine. That's you trying to learn. But blasphemy, we see a lot these days. We see a lot of people believe in evolution and reincarnation, things like that. And is that what the prophets taught? No, it's not. So to say that that's true is blaspheming the prophets. When they call Jesus uh, guilty of blasphemy, it's because he said, I am the Messiah. And of course, if he was the Messiah, that's not blasphemous. But if you or I were to say, I'm the Messiah, I have a Christ consciousness, something like that. That's blasphemy because the, the prophets teach there's only one Messiah. It's not a consciousness that we all go. So it's really interesting to see these. So there's violence, unrighteousness, apostasy is the result of blasphemy, just walking away from everything. If you actually believed what the prophets taught, you'd still be Christian. Okay. The Holy Lord will come forth with wrath and judgment to punish earth. In those days, violence will be cut off from its roots, and the roots of unrighteousness together with deceit will be destroyed from under heaven, and all of the idols of the heathen will be abandoned. Now, we look at this, and when I put this together, I still thought of it this way, too, that idols are just little idols, okay? And idolatry is an idol. That would be getting off because of the blasphemy and the apostasy thinking there's another god or spirit or demon or angel or something that you could pray to that would help you. Um, but in addition to that, the concept is when you commit blasphemy, commit um, apostasy, and you forget what the prophets even talk about, and you take wild guesses, you're making up your own religion. And so in that sense, that's idolatry. Because the scrolls talk about the Sadducees and the Pharisees being idolaters. And there's no way, according to their theology, they would have had small idols. So the idolatry is the doctrine. 
And of course, if the doctrine gets really bad, you'll actually have a small idol because you won't be paying attention to what the prophets teach. So it says, all the idols of the heathen will be abandoned. Temples will be burnt by fire and will be removed from the whole earth. The heathen will cast into the judgment, will be cast rather into the judgment of eternal fire. The righteous will arise from their sleep. That would be a resurrection. And wisdom will arise and be given unto them. After that, the roots of unrighteousness will be cut off and the sinners will be destroyed by the sword. Blasphemers will be cut off from every place, and those who planned violence in blasphemy will perish by the sword. So we're getting into the millennial reign and eventually into eternity. So that's basically what's going to happen. So at this point, he's just told us because of sin, there's going to be two judgments. So evidently, sin gets really bad. The flood comes and wipes everything out, but somehow everything survives. And gets bad again so that a judgment of fire now in other places he's talked about flood and fire so that's happening but and here he's just talking about judgments so because of these judgments you need to be righteous so then chapter 92 says the instruction in wisdom was written by enoch for every man of dignity judge of the earth all his children who dwell on the earth and future generations who practice righteousness and peace. Very important for us. Do not let your spirit be troubled on the account of the times, for the Holy Great One has appointed days for all things. So according to their, their consistent theology, is that like we, we always look for the rapture, the second coming. They were looking for the first coming. They're written in stone, if you will. God has a date picked. And it would be fruitless for us to say, Lord, can you delay your coming? Lord, can you speed up your coming? I really would like him to speed it up, but that's beside the point. He's got a date picked. I have no idea what it is, but he has a date picked. And when the destruction came from the temp for the temples in the first century, they weren't exactly on a certain uh, festival or anything. Or actually they were, but uh, they weren't on a certain year, as you would think on these calendars. Uh, so we don't know for sure until it happens. Um, the righteous one will arise from sleep. So there's a righteous one, okay, that dies and comes back, will arise from sleep. He will arise and walk in the paths of righteousness and all his paths will be in the eternal goodness and peace. He will be gracious to the righteous and give them eternal life. So we're talking about the Messiah. And he will give them power so that they will be endowed with goodness and righteousness. That's our second nature. Now we just got to get rid of our primary old man sin nature. They will walk in eternal light. We'll have eternal life if you follow Messiah. And sin will perish in darkness forever and will be no more seen from that day uh, furthermore, forevermore. <coughs> I am really looking forward to that. So, okay, that's what he says. Then he gives a 10-week prophecy. So this is an outline kind of, of time, all of time. So after that, Enoch began to recount from the books. And I didn't originally, when I put this together, know what we're talking about, but the patriarchal books. We've had um, a book now from Adam, Seth, Enos, Canaan, Mahaliel, Jared, and then now Enoch is writing things. So you've got at least six books. Uh, maybe others. So he's reaccounting the prophecies from the books and the things that he learned. So Enoch said, I wish to tell you the children of righteousness, that would be us believers, the elect of the world, the Jews, the Is Israeli nation, the plant of uprightness, which is the nation of Israel. Uh, and so all these things were prophesied to exist, the righteous believers of Jews and Gentiles, and they didn't know what really a Jew was at that point, but there was going to be a nation set apart for the Messiah to come through, and that's the plant of righteousness. It's talked about through many of the scrolls. So that's what he's talking about here. I, Enoch, will declare them to you, my sons. They have appeared to me in a heavenly vision, and I have been told by the word. That really should be capitalized. It really should be. The word of the holy angels 
and I have read from the heavenly tablets. So Enoch began to recount from the books and said. So this is where it starts. So again, we have 10 weeks each, you know, in, in a week, it's 10 weeks of years, but a week is seven days. So each day is a century. So this first week is 700 years. So let me flip back to the calendar real quick here. This is week one, day one through seven. So that gets us from the first year creation up to 699. Starting in week two, it'd be the year 700. And week three, it'd be 14. And then 21, 28, 36, 42, 49, 56, 63. And then finally, the year 7,000, which would start eternity. So that's what we're seeing here. So he's talking about week one, the first 700 years or this first seven days. So first, week one. So that's one to 700. And we've got that here. I was born in the seventh day of the first week while righteousness or justice and righteousness still endured. So flipping back over here, Enoch was born, if you look it up just in Genesis, count those up, in the year 622. So that would be between 600 and 691. So he is in the seventh day of the first week. So that's our first prophecy, or not prophecy, but timeline point. 622 a.m., the first week, the seventh day of the first week, Enoch's born. Okay, second week. After me, there will arise a second week, in the second week, great wickedness. And we all know what that was, the Nephilim problem, the apostasies, all that stuff. And deceit will, will spring up. Afterwards will be the first end. And of course, that's the flood, right? Okay. Mankind will be saved, but unrighteousness will revive, even though he will make a law for sinners. So what we're seeing here is that, number one, that this great wickedness arises. You've got Genesis chapter 6, all the Nephilim stuff, deceit springing up. After that week, though, there will be a destruction by, by a flood of water. And mankind will be saved with Noah and his household. He's not telling us how, but we know how it happened. Unrighteousness, though, revives after Noah. And, of course, we're living proof of that now. Even though he will make a law for sinners. So this is the Noahide law as given in Genesis 9. So that's pretty interesting. So if we go back to here, we go back. This week two is when the unrighteousness happens. And then after week two, in week three, we have the flood. And the flood occurs in 1656 a.m., or 1,656 years from creation. You can see that just by looking at Genesis 5 and Genesis 10. You can just add those numbers up. Um, and so that would be in the third day of the third week. And then also, uh, the Noahide laws are given. It'd be one year later, of course. And... Noah gives the Noahide laws to his sons, and they are the seven basic laws that we're supposed to live by. And then as his sons go out and form their own countries, they're supposed to add whatever they see fit to add or, you know, and change their laws and stuff like that, but never to go against the seven laws. So the seven laws, of course, as given are uh, no idolatry. You worship the one true God, the one true God of Noah you know, the guy on the boat that everyone acknowledges, um, the one that caused the destruction, the one that's sending a savior, the one that the prophets talk about. Um, so anyway, uh, and then you don't commit blasphemy. That's the second part. And again, that means you may not understand or may not have access to the Hebrew prophets when the Hebrews come around, but what you do know, you have to follow directions on. So they will explain to you how things work. So there, like I said, there's no evolution. There's resurrection. There's uh, a reincarnation. There's no resurrection. Or there's no reincarnation. There's resurrection. Um, and those kind of things. We're all sinners. We're all destined for hell. Hell is a real place. But because of what the Messiah will do, he will fix that. And we can have eternal life. All those things have been given. 
And then in the third week, also in day six, between 1900 and 1999 a.m., God entered into a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's to start this nation that the Messiah would come from. So let's, let's look at this then. So the second week, wickedness comes after the second week. Those things happen. Those are connected with that wickedness. Now the wickedness is destroyed. Laws are given. So then we start over. The third week then, which is 1400 to 21 a.m., or this B.C., after that, during the third week, a man, we'll call him Abraham, will be elected as the plant of righteousness. So that's the prophecy. There will be a guy that, that actually God picks and does something with, and you'll know it. Because it'll be at the end of the first age, we'll see later, with a, a fake government, a false religious system, which is Nimrod, his religious system, his tyranny government. And Anuki is his false prophet, and all that stuff is written later. At this, at this point, we don't know. We just know there's a guy coming that the Lord's going to do something with. But during that week, a man will be elected as the plant of righteousness. His posterity will become that plant of righteousness forevermore. And that's, of course, the nation of Israel. So it was given to Abraham, renewed with Isaac, renewed with Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And his 12 sons became the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. And so from that, then, we have the Messiah eventually coming. So again, back to our study, we have uh, God enters into the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that was during the sixth day of that third week. So now we get to week four. The prophecy says week in the fourth week, which is 2100 to 2800, basically, after that, during the fourth week, or that fourth set of 700 years, visions of a holy and righteous, of holy and righteousness, uh, which is, this is going to end up being God at Mount Sinai. This is the giving of the law, the creation of the nation of Israel coming out of Egypt, uh, which is the Exodus, basically. Uh, it will be seen, and the law, the Mosaic law for all generations and an enclosure a tabernacle and later a temple will be made for them. So during this fourth week, the posterity of this guy, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Israelites are made a nation given the law of Moses, given the tabernacle and eventually the, the temple. So that happens during the fourth week. And we see that in day four, uh, the law is given. And of course, the Exodus, according to all the other documents and all the numbers, was uh, 2448 a.m. So 2448 years after creation was the Exodus from Egypt, which would have been approximately 477 B.C. Uh, and I know a lot of people try to put this in the 1200s, but I'm just going by what the numbers are on the scrolls. So they say what they say. It's interesting that they all connect, though, that they don't contradict each other. So then we get to the fifth week. After that, in the fifth week, the house of dominion, this is probably Solomon's temple, because we went from a tabernacle to a temple, will be built for, and forever glorified. So at this point, we're having, I mean, his temple is destroyed. Then a new temple is built. That'd be Herod's temple, second temple. It's destroyed. We're going to have a temple or tabernacle, something, during the tribulation period that gets at least desecrated. And when the Messiah in the millennial reign builds a huge temple, so quite a bit different. But that temple concept is glorified forever. So that's the fifth week. And again, fifth week in day two, we have Solomon's temple being dedicated. That was uh, 2935 a.m. And so you can go back and look these up. I've written in, about them in several books. And again, you can just plug them in from um, Genesis, for that matter. You get um, um, Genesis 5 and 11 gets you down to Abraham at his birth in 1948. And then he, he makes, God makes a covenant with him um, at the age of 70, I believe. And then at that point, there is a 430-year prophecy. And that gets you to the Exodus. 
Then when you get to 1 Kings chapter 6, it says 400 and some years later after the Exodus, Solomon begins to construct the temple. So many years later, the temple is dedicated. So you can get all this just from scripture up to this point. Uh, pretty easy, actually. So 2935, 2935 years after creation, the temple of Solomon was dedicated. Okay, and then we go to the sixth week. And the sixth week here, it says, after that, in the sixth week, all who live in it will be blinded. So I'm assuming that's in the nation of Israel, or the temple, there's some sort of apostasy that happens. And their hearts will godlessly forsake wisdom. Um, in it, a man, uh, has to be Jesus, will ascend. Because no person has ever been born and lived a perfect life and ascended into heaven. Except for um, Enoch and Elijah, I suppose. But at this point, the dates don't match. So there's this guy, this man, that will ascend. At its close, the house of dominion will be burnt with fire. And the whole of the race of the chosen root, and of course that's of the plant of righteousness, which is Israel, will be dispersed. So that is pretty interesting. So at that point, plugging those in, this is during the sixth week, day one through seven. In day five, we have between 3,900 and 3,999, Jesus ascension. On their calendar, that would have been 3,957, which would have been on our calendar, 32 AD. The temple was burnt, burnt rather, 3,995, which was 70 AD. And then the dispersion of Israel happened with the Bar Kokhba rebellion, 132 to 135, which is around 4,057. So it's in that date. So all that stuff happens. Okay. So now we get to week seven. And this is where the confusing part is. And I have no idea really what this is. But this is what it says. Remember, it could be because we're missing part of the information or something else. One thing, I'll stop real quick on this. In the Testament of Noah that we found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, Noah makes a comment that during the year he was cooped up in the ark. I mean, there's not much to do but sit there and wait, you know. Uh, when there was light, he got the, the books out or the scrolls and tried to learn about his week. And I thought that was interesting. That obviously goes back to this and the prophecies. But as we've read, there's really not much about Noah. There's a little bit, but there's not much there that you could read or study. So that makes me wonder if we're not missing part of the prophecy. This is the Ethiopic version. We really want to find a full Aramaic or a full Hebrew version. Because when we put the um, scrolls together, as far as the calendar goes, the um, and I'll show you here in, in the Book of Enoch, we have the astronomical calendar section which is chapter 72 to 82. But um, there was one place that seemed misleading just the way it was written. It was kind of slightly garbled. In the Dead Sea Scroll version, though, it was perfectly clear. And that helped us figure out how the calendar actually worked. The uh, We were stuck on the um, leap week stuff. How, to, how does that work? And so that actually helped us. So if that's the case, this might be missing something also. But so far, we're, we're 100%. Um, let's see. So that happens. So then we get to the seventh week. Okay. So that would be between 4,200 and 4,900. Or actually, in the AD time frame, that's between 275 and 975. Okay. So somewhere basically between 300 to 1,000, something happens back then. And this is what it says. After that, in the seventh week, an apostate generation will arise. In their, or their rebellion will manifest in many different ways. Now remember, this has to be between 275 AD and 975 AD. So the only thing I'm thinking of is in this time period, the Gnostics actually rose up and are pretty much gone by 275. So that's almost like, well, it's over 300 years of Simon Magus Remember, he's mentioned in Acts, uh, so that would put him somewhere in the neighborhood of in the 30s AD. So 
250 years later you know it's like so but there's a lot of stuff that comes from the gnostic teachings in the medieval church and other things now the kabbalah comes out that would definitely fit as being very strange very corrupt but the kabbalah doesn't come out as far as i know until the 1200s so we're not talking about kabbalah we could theoretically be talking about islam it rising up but it takes many different ways so it's really interesting so in my note here i've got um uh anti-messiah and uh, cultic type teachings that might be found in the talmud uh, uh gamatria kabbalah corruption of the medieval church that was my guess but i have nothing to base that on but something happens between 275 and 975 which has got this in it so we have an apostate generation arises and obviously things get messed up taking many forms so we could say islam we could see all the breakoffs or different shoots of of the church that got really weird any gnosticism that was still around maybe proto um kabbalah type stuff that's around or who knows what else but it says at its close okay so at the close that would be the final day so that's between 875 and 975 so somewhere in that century the elect righteous now righteous would be believers but when it says elect righteous i'm assuming jewish believers because of the elect plant the elect righteous of the eternal plant oh there you go it's definitely jewish believers uh, of righteousness will be rewarded with a seven-fold instruction concerning all of his creation now it's been speculated that you know jews today make more discoveries in science and understand more and we're able to get more done than most of us and even if that's true that wouldn't that, that could possibly explain it if you're going to say sevenfold is a way of saying everything. You know, seven is complete, so it's the complete instruction. They understand everything, and they're just super smart, etc. But when it says a sevenfold instruction, it seems like it's a specific teaching or a specific something. This was between 875 and 975 AD, if this is correct. So it's not computers, it's not internet, it's not um, understanding of viruses, it's not med modern medicine, that kind of stuff. We were told that the Essenes had great medicine, um, not medicine, but herbal medicine, I guess I should say. So unless it was forgotten and revived, I don't think that's it, but it could be something like that. So it's interesting to see what happens. Um, it could be that texts that were held back um, are finally pulled together like a uh, new Essene movement that pulls all the scrolls together and has a full copy of everything and finally when you have everything in your library then you can read it and finally understand everything something like that and so this is the thing that Josh Peck was saying he has a, a clue of what this might actually be so we'll have him on next week if if we can get him on and um see what we say about that but this is the confusing part the rest of it's pretty pretty good it says it continues by saying uh who is there and all of the children of men who is able to hear the voice of the holy one with trembling um probably believers filled with the spirit who can think his thoughts well we have the mind of christ so we'll see what's going on here who is there that can behold all the works of heaven? That would be none of us. Who could behold the heaven and understand the things of heaven, see his soul and spirit and relate to it, or ascend and see their ends and think and do like them? Who is the man who could know that his breath, what is the breath and the length of the earth, and to whom uh has been shown the measure of them all this kind of sounds like job i mean what human being can do any of this and the answer would be none of us or is there anyone who could discern the length of heaven 
and what is found what it is founded upon or could the number of stars uh, and know all the luminaries where they rest so no i guess not now here's 91b because remember they they had that stuff overlap so we tried to put it in in, in order so this is the eighth week okay so so far we've got and and i've got possibly protestant reformation and forward in that day of the eighth oh no that's something else never mind Sometime in the seventh week, we've got the sevenfold wisdom given. And we just don't know what that is. So now we're in the eighth week, which is here. And the eighth week says, after that, there will be another, the eighth week, and that of righteousness. And a sword will be given to it. And so it will pass righteous judgment upon oppressors. So if the bulk of the entire church or bulk of the entire world was governed by a corrupt medieval church and we have the Protestant Reformation, the, um, the break off of the Eastern Orthodox churches, things like that, that could be what we're talking about. Uh, sinners will be delivered into the hands of the righteous during its completion. Now remember, its completion would be that last day so somewhere between 1575 and 1675 or maybe even slightly before but at its completion during the completion they will acquire houses through their righteousness and a house will be built for honor for the great king forever so it does kind of sound like if you think of uh martin luther in 1517 nailing the 95 theses to the door of the wittenberg church and then him being tried in 1521 at the Diet of Worms, the Council of Worms, Worms, Germany. Um, and then from that, as time goes out, the Protestant Reformation begins. And you get Lutherans and Calvinists and eventually Baptists and everybody. And, and things kind of balance out. So that could be what we're talking about here. Ninth week. It says, after that, in the ninth week, the righteous judgment will be revealed to the whole world. A reestablishment of the nation of Israel, probably. So that happens between 56 and 63, which is between 1675 and 2375. I know that's a big gap, but it's a 700-year period. So in that time period, Israel is reborn. We know that to be 1948. And all the works of godless, of the godless, will vanish from the earth during this time. If this is 2375, that would be, uh, if you're believing like I am, definitely way into the millennial reign. So the tribulation has already happened, the rapture, resurrection, things like that. The world will be written down for destruction. That would be that great tribulation. And all men will look toward the path of integrity. And so that would definitely be the development of that. So back here in week um, nine, is that week nine? What were we looking at? Yeah, ninth week. Okay. So here's the ninth week. And here's our century. Our century in this calculation is day four, which is between 1975 and 2000. 74 basically that hundred year time period so in that time period we think we will have the um the rapture the tribulation period the the second coming the start of the millennial reign and that makes sense because um somewhere in there and then we have week 10. so let's look at this week 10 says this after this in the 10th week in the seventh part so that's right here Okay, so we're going to have a white throne judgment is basically what it's going to tell us between 6900 and 6999, start of eternity. So that'd be 2975 um, up to 29, that time period. So that last part of it, there will be a great eternal judgment in which he will judge the watchers. That was in the first part of the book. The great eternal heavens will appear in the midst of the angels. 
the first heaven will depart and pass away. That sounds just like Revelation. And a new heaven will appear. And all the powers of the heavens will give sevenfold light forever. So here's that sevenfold again. I don't know if the sevenfold light has anything to do with sevenfold instruction. And then we have eternity. So if we go back to this, again, if we have the great white throne judgment here, the last day of the 10th week before eternity starts, a thousand years before this, if we go back, 2975 is when that would end. So we should go back to a uh, thousand years. That would put us 1975. So it's that, that century. So between 1975 and 2075, that 100-year period, should be the rapture, the tribulation period, the second coming, start of the millennial reign, building of the temple, that kind of stuff somewhere in there now we're still you know got a good amount of that time left but right now it's i'm giving you this teaching and it's uh may 31st 2021 so we're getting pretty a lot closer to 74 than 75 we're we're definitely getting there so it's in here somewhere so i wanted to share that with you this has been the, the apocalypse of week and it's the 10-week prophecy uh, prophecy of the 10 weeks. So again, what he's doing is breaking this up, and this will be online here eventually, probably this next week, because I'm trying to get everything organized. But he breaks time up into seven, or excuse me, 10 weeks, with each day being 100 years, a century. And accurately predicted, uh, Enoch's birth, the flood, the Noahide laws, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob starting the nation of Israel, the Mosaic law being given, Solomon's temple being dedicated, Jesus' ascension, the burning of the temple in 70 AD, Israel being dispersed, and then some sort of sevenfold wisdom given in the Middle Ages, kind of. Uh, Protestant Reformation, and then our century, and then the great white throne judgment. So not a whole lot in this. And again, I'm wondering if there might be extra stuff, but that's what he gives on this. So what I've done on these, and we'll get to them eventually, like the first 500 years, and we'll see the same thing. There's Shemitahs, and then there's Jubilees, and again, another 50-year period, and another 50-year period. So again, we got 50, 100, 150 from creation. And then BC here going forward. So we'll try to put in stuff in here like this. So Seth is born at 1.30 a.m. So 1.30 is the second year of the fifth Shemitah of the second Jubilee. That's the way the book of Jubilees would write all the dates. And so we're just trying to pull all these together. So we have a Jubilee calendar, an AM calendar, and an ADBC calendar. And if they all mesh together, we almost have to be right. Three separate calendars, you know. And so that's what we're trying to do, go through each one of these. We want to focus on the eighth Una, because that's prophesied. And that's got a lot of stuff that haps, happens with the Maccabees and with the Essenes. And then the twelfth Una is the things of our age. As you can see, I don't have much in here. But World War II, um, Israel coming back, and some of the different prophecies. So we'll go ahead and stop there for tonight. So like I say, next week, um, we'll probably real briefly go over the chart again. So I think that chart, you know, helps everything. And then um, see what Josh Peck has to say about the other stuff. So that'll be pretty interesting. God bless.